Good evening. Isn't it wonderful to hear the Civic Band here in downtown Piqua? The band is under the direction of Brett Poling. It's certainly a treasure, and Bob Hans, who was a good friend of Bill McCulloch, would be proud of the, tr of the tradition you have kept alive. Now, would you all please stand for the presentation of our national anthem, featuring members of the Piqua High School choirs, under the direction of Tom Westfall. Please remain standing for our invocation that will be delivered by Reverend Cheryl Willis, co-pastor of the Second Baptist Church here in Piqua. Cheryl. If you'll bow your heads with me. Father God, we thank you for this day that we have come together as a community to honor a great man in the history of this country and of this city. But we before we do that, Lord Jesus, we honor you, the creator of us all, the creator of all things. We thank you, Lord, for the spirit of the man who brought together people at a time in history that was greatly needed by the people in this country. We thank you for the spirit you placed in him to bring together all people in the spirit of love and unity. We thank you, Lord, for giving us a man who helped to change the fabric of this country. Now we honor him today, Lord Jesus, by dedicating the plaza in Piqua to his name. And Lord Jesus, we, we ask that in the spirit of the man, that this plaza will be a place where the people of this community can come together in love and unity and fun and celebration and peace. For that, Lord Jesus, we give you thanks, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may all be seated. Thank you, Cheryl, that was wonderful. Welcome, one and all, to this historic occasion. My name is Mike Gutman, and I have the privilege to serve as Master of Ceremonies for this evening's program. We have a special evening planned, a fitting tribute to the life and accomplishments of our honoree, the late Congressman William M. McCulloch. We have a number of family, friends, elected officials, and honored guests to recognize and I'll call on Jim Oda to assist me in that duty. First, we wish, we wish to recognize those seated here on the balcony. Please hold your applause until I've, after I have introduced everyone. Andy Berner is co-chair of this committee. Reverend Cheryl Willis delivered our invocation. Colleen McMurray, Ann Carver, and Nancy McCulloch, daughters of William M. McCulloch, Andy Height, Mayor Tom Hudson, 
and the Honorable John Boehner. Thank you. Next, we would like to recognize those elected officials that are seated out in our audience this evening on behalf of Senator Sherrod Brown, Angela Blackburn is with us this evening. Thank you. On behalf of Governor Ted Strickland, Brewster Rhodes, who is the director of the governor's office for Southwest Ohio. Thank you. Our state senator, Fred Strayhorn. Fred? Okay. And the individual holding the same position in the 1930s by, uh, held by Congressman McCullough, State Representative Dick Adams. Our county commissioners, John Bud O'Brien, Bud's here, and Jack Evans, representing our county. And representing the fine city of Piqua, our city commissioners, Lucy Fess, John Martin, Judy Terry, and Bill Vogt. Thank you all for being here. The family of William M. McCulloch is also well represented here this evening. In addition to Anne and Nancy, Anne's husband, David Carver, and their two daughters, Elizabeth Carver and Sarah Carver, are here, along with Sarah's husband, Dennis. Welcome. Another part of our evening dedication is to the civil rights movement in the city of Piqua. And we have a number of citizens that participated in this groundbreaking event locally in the 1940s and after that. We have representing Daryl Taylor, his son, Joseph Taylor. His father was the president of the local NAACP when the very first sit-in right here in this hotel occurred. Another one of our activists in Piqua, William Bud Thomas, is represented by his daughter, Shirley Thomas Duncan. She may not be with us this evening. And another very active individual in our community, Walter Thomas, very active in the local NAACP chapter, is represented by his son, Art Thomas. Art, I know Art's here. Thank you. William McCulloch served a distinguished 25 years as our congressman. From his first victory in a special election in 1947 to his final term ending in 1973. In the late 1950s and into the 1960s, Mr. McCulloch was more than just our congressman. Without seeking fanfare or publicity, this small town country lawyer, as he liked to refer to himself, stepped forward and led the Congress in passing the most sweeping civil rights legislation of its time. From public accommodations, including the simple right to be served in a public restaurant, to voting rights and school desegregation, Mr. McCulloch led the way because he believed that it was the right thing to do. Today, on the 45th anniversary of the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, we remember and honor his efforts and the struggle for equality under the law. Our first honored speaker is the daughter of Emerson and Viola Clemens, longtime Piqua residents known to many of you. During the 1940s, they stepped forward to lead the sit-ins at the bus station lunch counter. A 1947 graduate of Piqua High School and 1951 graduate of Ohio State University, Mrs. McMurray has worked as an advocate for foster children and other social work for 30 years. Please welcome Colleen McMurray. Mr. Gutman, Mr. Berner, Ms. Ann McCullough Carver, Nancy McCullough, Honorable John Boehner, distinguished guests, people of Piqua and elsewhere. 
Thank you for affording me the opportunity to share with you some memories of childhood and adulthood in Piqua and how our family's relationship with Mr. William McCullough has influenced my life. What I have to share with you are facts and experiences that I remember vividly. Please listen, think on them, for they represent one black woman's journey toward the promises and dreams of this country. The growing up years, I was born here in Piqua in 1930. My parents were Emerson and Viola Clemens, who some of you know or remember. They were special people who were nurturers and teachers in the strong values of family, church, education, and community. I have two sisters, Wanda, who lives in McLean, Virginia, and Becky, who continues to live here in Piqua. We lived here in an integrated neighborhood. I attended Piqua Public Schools where excellence was expected by parents and teachers. I achieved in academics assisted by supportive faculty at every school I attended. I remember fondly Ms. Baker at Wilder, Mr. Gates and Ms. Hemmert, and Mr. Winter at Piqua High School, and many, many others. I participated in plays and musicals, the marching choir, ensembles. I was a class officer, a reporter for the smoke signals, a cheerleader at Wilder. I was, I was in the National Honor Society and Quill and Scroll. I attended dances and even slumber parties because all of my close friends were both black and white. I did not feel different at school in Piqua at all. In the community, however, I was told in many ways that I was different. We attended separate churches, which I think continues today. We participated in a black-only club at the YWCA, which to me is somewhat ironic because of the mission of the YWCA. We could not swim anywhere in Piqua, or play tennis, or golf, or go to skating rinks. We could not stay in any lodging facility in this city. We could not eat in any local restaurant. I look now at the recently renovated Fort Piqua Plaza, and I remember downstairs when my friends and I could only go inside to get magazines or cards, but we could not eat. In 1945, with local NAACP members, including my parents and many others, we staged a sit-in, which eventually changed that policy. We were required to sit at the movie theater in the back three rows on the right. Also about 1945, the same group of activists entered the theater in pairs and we scattered throughout the theater, thus forcing the manager to relent after some gentleman spoke about how we should be able to sit anywhere. We were only allowed to work as domestics and elevator operators or waitresses at the country club during our teenage years. I was viewed as different. I graduated from high school at age 16 and was very challenged to move to Columbus and attend the Ohio State University at such a young age. I think all of you may have remembered, or most of you may have remembered, my mother, who was a, a strict parenting person. In 1947, World War II had just ended, and the campus was full of veterans. And I remember to this day my mother advising me not to date any of those veterans because they were too worldly. And I adhered to that for at least two years. The same negative situations existed in Columbus, except they were more harsh. There were restricted restaurants. Black students could not eat near the campus. We could only attend matinees. We could not go to evening performances at the theaters. We could not live in campus housing until 1950. I moved into a dormitory with my roommate, Gloria Owens, who just happened to be the daughter of Jesse Owens, 
and we were allowed to live there for one year. There were no athletes on the basketball team who were black, and only one on the football team. Now, of course, this was in 1950, 51. It's a little bit different now. In spite of all of this, my goal was to attain a degree, which I did in 1951. But again, I was viewed as different. My professional careers as a, as a social worker mirrored the discrimination of situations in the nation until the 1960s. I've always been an advocate of children. Most of my social work career has been either at the county level in children's services where I had a separate caseload where they had to go to different kinds of foster homes, or I worked in mental health. And finally, I retired as the director of Medicaid services for the state of Ohio for all children under 21 years of age, which allowed me the privilege of visiting all 88 counties and getting to know a great many of people like you here in Miami County. Now let's talk a bit about Mr. McCullough and my memories of him and his family. While at the Ohio House of Representatives and later as a U.S. Congressman, he visited my parents' home numerous times to discuss issues, learn about American racism, and conversed on what should be. That is a personal approach rather than the national polls which exist today. He and Mrs. McCullough even asked me to be a companion, not a babysitter, but a companion to Nancy and Ann when they, as parents, were attending events. I met Nancy and Ann just recently, just a few minutes ago. Nancy remembered me much to my glee. Ann could not, which really hurt my feelings. <laughs> After he was elected to the United States House of Representatives, Mr. McCullough continued his contacts with my parents on minority issues and, in fact, regularly shipped congressional record albums or vo volumes to them. Last year, as I cleared my deceased parents' home, I found those volumes and gave them to the Pickle Public Library. My sister Wanda worked as a volunteer in Mr. McCullough's Washington office in the 1950s. He was a giant force for right and decency. He did not make me feel different. Now, as we honor Mr. McCullough today, I think of our special president, Barack Obama, the current challenges and those ahead for him, and how glorious it would be if Mr. McCullough could work by his side and in concert arrive at sensible solutions. With that partnership of Mr. McCullough and President Obama, no one would be made to feel different again in this great country. Thank you for listening. Colleen, thank you so much for your special words and thoughts uh, today. It really hits home uh, what we're accomplishing today and what we're trying to recall about uh, Congressman McCulloch and, and the efforts that were made many years ago. Next, we'll have the opportunity to hear from William McCulloch's daughters. First, Ann Carver. Ann resides in York, Pennsylvania. She served 18 years as, as Executive Director of the United Cerebral Palsy Organization for Southeastern Pennsylvania, and she, was, she has remained active in politics over the years. Her sister Nancy worked in the Governmental Affairs Office for Sears Roebuck in Washington, D.C., and still resides there. Please welcome Ann McCulloch Carver. Everyone before me is quite tall. <laughs> all right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. 
I look out and I see some people that I haven't seen for two or three years. Piqua is my hometown, as it was the place where my father first came to practice law. And we lived here, and or I lived here until I left and grew up and got married and went away and traveled. I see other people over here. And I want to thank those of you who stopped me along the way, who didn't know me but saw my name peg and told me some story about my father and how he had helped your family. I was asked to talk about the family ties and growing up young in Piqua. I know that my father was a man of great honesty because when I was a very small girl, I was caught not telling the truth. And to this day, I remember how he told me that it was always best to step forward and tell the truth. Those were the things he lived by. He was born on a farm and the farmland here in Miami County brought joy to his heart when he came home on the weekends for rest and re relaxation. And he also made sure that the young man from Troy that I married knew one cow from another. <laughs> and you can be assured when he came home in the summer and he went for a week to each of the seven counties in his district to have an open house office. I suspect there are many of you in this crowd tonight who can remember going to talk to my father about a problem you had on your farm or in your business or with government at the local level or the federal level. I want you to know and, and if you know the answer to this question, raise your hand, because I think it's so appropriate that we are here on July 2nd. I want you to know if you know what happened on July 2nd, 1963. Does anyone know? Just a few of you. I'm going to read just a small paragraph from Chuck, Charles, and Barbara Whalen's book, regarding my father in the civil rights legislation. This is what happened. Turn around and look across the street at McCulloch, Felger, Fight, and Gutton behind that great big green tree. On July 2nd, 1963, Bobby Kennedy's Assistant Attorney General, Burke Marshall, flew out from Washington to try to persuade McCulloch to back President Kennedy's civil rights bill. Marshall was met at the Dayton airport by McCulloch's son-in-law, David Carver, a University of Michigan graduate student, because McCulloch was busy speaking to the Piqua Rotarians. He told David to take Marshall to lunch and give him a tour of Piqua. They did that, and finally the two men said goodbye at the second floor law office overlooking the public square. There they mapped out the strategy for the passage of the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. This happened in this town right here where we are. And forever, our country will be different and stronger. Thank you for coming to honor him. It is with great passion that I say, God bless you. Good evening to you all. It is a great pleasure for me to look across the square to see McCulloch, Felger, Fight, and Gutman. I used to go there on Sundays and pound on the typewriter. That was before we had such marvelous electronic devices that we do today. I wonder how many children will remember having fun on the typewriter in their daddy's office. 
My father had two words that he really loved, comprehensive and moderate. His legislation view was always moderate and always comprehensive. That is a good way to be when you are a legislator. Daddy was a legislator from the time I was born until he went to the Army in 1943 on Christmas Eve. He returned in um, September of 1945, and he ran for Congress. And I'm looking across the street, and it says 1847, exactly 100 years from the time the Piqua National Bank and Trust Company building was built. It is a great joy to remember all these things. To be moderate in joy and to be comprehensive in how you speak is a divine wish. How many of you do have a computer? All right, will you go home and look up Abraham Lincoln on divine will. You will read something that is really, totally, and terribly beautiful and awesome. God bless you, and may the square be here for years. Thank you, Anne and Nancy, for those wonderful thoughts, remembering back upon your father. And uh, we've had a wonderful uh, few evenings with the daughters, getting to reminisce about Piqua. Uh, they do have fond memories of Piqua. And uh, it's been a wonderful time visiting with them and with their daughters. At this time, uh, there's a, we have a, a small musical selection. Um, the Pickle High School Choir, again under the direction of Tom Westfall, uh, has something prepared for us, and I'll turn it over to Tom. Why don't you swing down chariots up and let me ride? Swing down chariots up and let me ride. Rock me, Lord, rock me, Lord, nice and easy.
Thank you, that was wonderful. Uh, the, the band and also the, the, the kids from our high school are some of the best ambassadors from Piqua, and they really do an excellent job um, and really enjoy their, their music. The story of Bill McCulloch's crucial role in the passage of the landmark legislation is well told in the book by Charles and Barbara Whalen. The longest debate chronicles the winding path of the civil rights legislation, which took over, over a year to its conclusion with the signing by President Lyndon Johnson. Early in that process, as Anne related to you, Robert Kennedy sent his chief deputy here to meet with Bill McCulloch and obtain his support for the bill. Our committee was privileged to receive a message from Nicholas Katzenbach, who was a member of Robert Kennedy's staff at the time and later succeeded him as United States Attorney General. Mr. Katzenbach writes, in part, it took the hard work of many people to secure the enactment of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and break the back of racial segregation. But there was no single person more crucial to its success than Congressman William McCulloch. He deserves every honor Piqua can bestow on him. To help us in that endeavor, we're pleased and privileged that our present Congressman, the Honorable John Boehner, has chosen to be here and deliver the keynote remarks this evening. Congressman Boehner is in his 10th term in the U.S. House of Representatives. For the past two terms, he has been honored to be the House Republican leader. Please join with me in welcoming our Congressman, John Boehner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening uh, to all of you. It's certainly a privilege to be here this evening to honor the former Congressman William McCulloch. Although I have heard the name McCulloch, and then I have heard others refer to him as Bill McCullough. And so whatever pleases you, but the, sis the, the sisters, the daughters, remind me it's McCulloch. You know, without, uh, without Bill McCulloch, uh, our nation might be a vastly different place than it is today. Uh, Congressman McCulloch served our community for 26 years, uh, rising from the Ohio State House uh, to the U.S. House of Representatives, where he served with honor. At the time, this was known as Ohio's fourth congressional district, and uh, McCulloch won a special election to fill the vacant seat uh, when Robert Franklin Jones resigned uh, to take a position on the Federal Communications Commission. And then, as you've heard, Congressman McCulloch served uh, our community uh, for 12 terms before retiring to practice law uh, right back here in Piqua. Our nation has changed much uh, since Congressman McCulloch represented this area. And it's not an exaggeration uh, to say that some much needed changes in our country might not have happened without him. In 1960, President Kennedy campaigned on the promise of passing civil rights legislation. But three years later, the nation was still waiting over this, le this legislation, and racial tensions were rising all across our country. Governor Wallace refused to let black students register at the University of Alabama. President Kennedy then mobilized the state's National Guard in an embarrassing rebuke for Wallace. Medgar Evans was assassinated in his driveway just hours after President Kennedy delivered a national radio address supporting the civil rights legislation. And Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., eloquently told the nation about his dream of equality of justice and of freedom. President Kennedy, who had made this campaign promise, turned to an Ohio Republican uh, to make that promise a reality. As the top Republican on the House Judiciary Committee, uh, Bill McCullough uh, could be a powerful force for moving the civil rights legislation through the U.S. House. But he agreed to work on the legislation with two conditions. First, that the House uh, not, and the administration not come, uh, cave under pressure from the Senate, which at the time featured a block of Southern Democrats who had already made known their opposition to civil rights legislation. And the second, that the administration give equal credit uh, to Republicans uh, for their efforts on this bill. 
And when uh, the Kennedy administration agreed to Bill's conditions, uh, he said about grinding the bill uh, down and moving the bill through the House Judiciary Committee with bipartisan support. Uh, Congressman McCulloch worked hard through the fall to get a bill onto the House floor for a vote. But then the unthinkable happened. November 22nd, 1963, as bullets cut down President Kennedy and shocked the nation. It took another three months for this civil rights bill uh, to get to the floor of the House and to pass. And uh, a year after uh, the United States Attorney General uh, sent an emissary, as you've heard, to PICWA uh, to ask for Congressman McCulloch's help, President Lyndon Johnson signed the landmark Civil Rights Act. When he was asked later uh, why he shepherded the Civil Rights Act uh, through the House, uh, Bill said that he believed that, quote, there are obligations on a man who is elected to Congress to try to implement some of these basic rights set forth in the Constitution. Certainly, Congressman McCulloch knew how important the Civil Rights Act uh, would be to the country, but he didn't agree to shepherd the bill through Congress for political reasons. He did it because he believes it was the right thing to do. As I've often said to my colleagues and to my kids, if you do the right things for the right reasons, the right things will happen. For too long, uh, Congressman McCulloch's work on the Civil Rights Act has gone unsung. And I'm glad to see Piqua, the very town where some of the most powerful men in Washington I came to ask him for his help. I'm glad that you're honoring him tonight. Congressman McCulloch died on February 22, 1980. His life and his work uh, were remembered in newspapers throughout the nation and by his colleagues in the Congress. A Congressman Richard Bowling, a Missouri Democrat and chairman of the House Rules Committee and a, a, real, a real fighter in the Congress, um, made clear that the debt our country owed to his friend Bill McCullough when he said, if it had not been for Bill McCullough, there would be no civil rights legislation. So we're here tonight to honor a man whose work profoundly changed our nation. A Congressman William McCulloch's life was defined by his principles, including his discipline in not raiding the federal treasury, one thing that I've, we, we share in common. Uh, but also by the values he learned right here in Piqua as a young attorney. He took those values to Congress, where he served honorably and made the country a better place for future generations. And when those future generations visit P Williams, uh, Piqua's William Moore McCulloch Square and read about the life and works of this great man, they'll learn about a man who did the right thing for the right reasons. And thanks to him, the Civil Rights Act was signed into law. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Congressman Boehner, for your presence and for your remarks on this historic occasion in our city. You know, what we're trying to obtain tonight is, is a, a measure of the man, Bill McCulloch, and, and what he was like. And we received a message from someone who worked closely with him. Joseph Metz was an assistant to Congressman McCulloch in 1964. He went on to get his doctorate and his law degree. He writes, I was present in the House of Representatives when the Civil Rights Bill, which Mr. McCulloch authored, was signed into law. And we rejoiced and celebrated when President Johnson signed the bill on July 2nd. Mr. McCulloch, always the courtly statesman, went off to the White House in his blue blazer, gray pants, and beautiful striped necktie to witness the signing of the bill. He never sought to be the center of attention. It was enough for him that he knew in his heart that he followed our great president, Abraham Lincoln, in bringing, bringing equality to people of color. Mr. McCulloch was a joy to be with, and he savored historical moments in his life. He would surely smile upon you today. Above all, he loved his congressional district and was happiest visiting each county fair in the beautiful summer months. He was a good congressman and a great American statesman. I think that really says it well. At this time, I'd like to call upon Andy Height. Andy represents the Ohio Historical Society for the unveiling of our marker. 
On behalf of the Ohio Historical Society, I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to be here this evening and talk a little bit about the marker program. Ohio's historical markers grew from the state's sesquicentennial celebration in 1953. At that time, corporate limit markers were established to mark the significant history of each community. Four years later, today's Ohio historical markers were created to enable communities to, to describe in greater detail their historically significant events and individuals. Today, there are over a thousand of these markers spread out across Ohio, and if you ask my kids, I've stopped at all of them. Ohio's marker program is the most democratic in the United States. Each state has a marker program, usually coordinated by a state historical society or historical commission. Staff members from those state programs decide what is historically significant and which sites, events, or people should have a marker. In Ohio, local citizens decide what is historically significant about their own community and submit applications for a marker. The local people do the research on the marker topic and draft the proposed text for the marker. The Ohio Historical Society helps local groups validate historical facts, edit the text for grammar and standard conformity, and prepare the text for manufacture of the marker. This marker belongs to PICWA and was made possible through donations from the law firm McCullough, Felger, Feich, and Gutman and its individual partners. The committee also received a grant from the Ohio Historical Society. Congratulations in order for all the hard work that was gone into making this a reality and for taking the initiative to identify and preserve for future generations the important contributions of Willa M. McCullough that he made to America's history. This marker has different but related messages on each side. On the north side of the marker, as you look toward the Fifth Third Bank building, is a biography of William M. McCullough and his legacy as a principal mover of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. On the south side of the marker, as you look toward the Piqua Plaza, and the former site of the bus station lunch counter is the summary of the civil rights activism in Piqua in the 1940s and 50s. The text of the marker is contained in your program. History is important. Knowing the past helps us know ourselves and our place in today's world. History helps us to better understand what we have and where we as a society are going. This marker commemorating William M. McCullough's contributions and his place in history joined the other markers in Ohio that serve as an outdoor textbook for both local and Ohio history. And now unveiling Ohio's newest marker are Elizabeth Carver and Sarah Carver Lim, granddaughters of William M. McCullough, and assistant as Larry Hamilton, representing the Piqua Diversity Committee, and Joseph Taylor, son of Daryl Taylor, former leader of the local NAACP chapter. Thank you, and I hope in the days and weeks ahead, each of you will take time to personally review the marker and, and just take it in a little bit and uh, appreciate its, its significance in the centerpiece of our town. Next, I'll call on the mayor of the city of Piqua, Tom Hudson, for his remarks. Tom. Welcome to everyone on behalf of the city of Piqua. About eight months ago, we gathered here as a community to rededicate this glorious structure, the Fort Piqua Plaza, is now home of our Piqua Public Library, the most public place in Piqua, as well as wine and fine chocolates and candies, co fine cho coffee and chocolates, and soon to be Toon Peas Restaurant over here to your right. I think that's August 1st. This building has seen its share of memorable events from presidents delivering campaign speeches, to African-American citizens staging citizens at the bus station lunch counter to my left. As we have heard, Bill McCulloch took up the call for citizens of Piqua as well as those across the country to assure equality under the law for everyone. This evening is my privilege as the mayor of the city of Piqua to declare that this public square is rededicated in the honor of Congressman William M. McCulloch. New signs have been posted at each end of the square, which are a visible reminder of his legacy to all citizens and visitors. Thank you all to have made this dedication possible.
Thank you, Mayor Hudson. I did just look out uh, seeing an old friend, and I want to recognize him. Bill Milligan is here with his wife, Sue. Hey, Bill. Bill came to town about 20 years ago and presented a program with my wife regarding Bill McCulloch for the YWCA in one of their annual meetings. And it was the start of some of the efforts to recognize Bill McCulloch uh, in a more visible way. I would like to thank each of the speakers and participants for making this a memorable occasion. I want to thank the dedication committee who have worked for over six months in preparing this evening's event. They include Lisa Baker, Andy Berner, Fred Enderley, Paul Gutman, Larry Hamilton, Bruce Jamison, Jim Oda, Lorna Swisher, Susie Wise, Gordon Wise, and Terry Wright. Please give them a round of applause. I want to thank all of you for being here and taking in part of this celebration. Let's all continue to enjoy the evening as I turn the program back over to Brett Poling and our Piqua Civic Band. Thank you and good evening. Thank you very much. So here's the part of the portion of the program where we get you involved. If you'll take out your programs, we're going to start with a patriotic sing-along here in the second half.